right, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to those of you here in Soils 415 and also on Zoom. Uh, my name is Kelly Wells and I am a research scientist in the Department of Soil, Water and Climate and I co-organize our department seminar along with Dr. Vasu Sharma. Um, and before I introduce our speakers today, I just want to mention that our final uh, seminar of the semester will be next week, Wednesday, uh, April 20th. And that will be completely on Zoom, although I think we'll stream it in 415 if you want to join us here as well, but um, the speaker will be remote and that'll be Dr. Christine Sprunger from The Ohio State University. So please join us for that. But today I have the honor of introducing our two lightning speakers today. Um, they are both uh, faculty here at Soil, Water and Climate. We have Yushin Mao, who's an assistant professor and associate director of the Precision Agriculture Center and also Dr. Vasu Sharma, who is our assistant extension professor and irrigation specialist. So Yushin, would you like to go first? Or I don't know if you discussed that ahead of time. Yeah, you can go first. All right. <laughs> <laughs> no, sir, I mean, uh, it's a pleasure to be All right, thank you so much, Kelly, for a nice introduction. I'll quickly share my slides. Okay. Very good. And then can you go to Zoom? Oh, yes. And do share screen. Sure. Okay. All right. So Thank you all for coming who are in person and who are on Zoom as well. So my name is Vasu Sharma. Uh, as Kelly said, I work with irrigation. Uh, I joined this position in 2018. And before that, uh, I did my grad school, both PhD and my uh, master's in agriculture and biological systems engineering from University of Nebraska-Lincoln uh, before coming here. Uh, and before that, I did my <laughs> bachelor's in agricultural engineering from uh, Punjab Agricultural University in India. So that's my quick background. Uh, so today I'll be talking about irrigation management uh, for profitable corn production, water conservation and groundwater quality protection. So I'll be talking about uh, some of my research projects that I started here uh, when I joined on this position. Not all uh, because of the time, but a couple of them and then uh, some extension work that I have been doing uh, in terms of uh, relaying that research knowledge to our stakeholders. So some extension uh, and outreach activities I'll be sharing with you today. So starting with uh, introduction of irrigation, uh, for those who don't know, uh, we are irrigating around 650-ish or you know around 700 now, uh, I can say acres of crop irrigation in the state. And this map here on the right side uh, shows you the active agricultural irrigation permits in Minnesota. So if you are, uh, pumping more than 10,000 gallons of water per day uh, for irrigation purposes, you need a permit from Department of Natural Resources. So that's the data that you're showing, uh, that you're seeing in this, in this map. So you see most of this, uh, most of the irrigated permits are in the Central Sands region. Uh, can you see my mouse, like on the zoom? Okay, in the Central Sands region or in the Dakota County area. And these areas are mostly a uh, glacial outwash sand. So the texture of the soil uh, is this coarse texture soil. So that's where most of the irrigation is happening. And major crops that are being grown here are corn, soybean, dry beans, and potatoes. And they are very, uh, these are the crops that are very sensitive to uh, water stress and needs water for, for, for growing, particularly in this sandy soil region. So why irrigation is important? Uh, basically in this region uh, and for all other, uh, parts of the state as well, there are short dry periods uh, that are very common in summer. So when crop needs that water most, uh, that's when there is no rainfall, even though you know our climate projections shows us that there is going to be more water, but there are still that, that time frame in June or July period when a crop is near to its vegetative growth and uh, uh, close to reproduction, uh, when it is very sensitive to crop growth, we don't have that rain uh, that we need for crop growth. So there are these short dry periods where irrigation becomes very essential for crop growth, uh, as well as it, it is coupled with the soil. So the soils that we are irrigating are 
uh, very low water holding capacity soil, sandy soils that cannot hold much water for longer period of time. So even if we have rain, that rain doesn't stay in that soil profile or root zone for very long so that crop can take it. So we need frequent irrigations, uh, even if we have a good rain uh, to sustain the crop production. Uh, and irrigation becomes really very important in, in those periods and in those sandy soils. And they, uh, uh, the data shows that irrigation, without irrigation, the crop production in these areas are, is, not, is not feasible. What I mean to say is not profitable. So if growers grow crop in this area without irrigation, it's not very profitable crop production. So irrigation becomes it very profitable. So it's very important for economy of, of this part of the state as well. Uh, so this map here shows you what I just talked about, uh, the water holding capacity. So the map shows you the available water storage uh, in zero to 40 inches of soil profile. So the if you see uh, here in the central, central region of the state, we have only, so the red and the yellowish color, uh, the available water storage in this top soil profile is from zero to five inches. So very, very uh, low water storage in, in this in this. Uh, area so irrigation as i said is, is very important but at the same time we have challenges with, with irrigation so since these are very sandy soils it's they're very prone to nitrate or nutrient leaching so if you do not irrigate it efficiently that if you irrigate more than it can hold uh, the water that it can hold it's going to be uh, the water is going along with all the important nutrients is going into the groundwater that is being used for drinking water and other purposes so nitrate leaching is, is a huge concern in this area and if you see the lower diagram here it shows you that all our groundwater resources are also interlinked with surface water so when we pump a lot of water in in growing season uh, that also impacts the stream level so water in the streams that that has direct impact on aquatic uh, aquatic life in the in the in the lakes and in the streams. So uh, that's really important that how we manage irrigation in, in this area. So water quantity is one issue. So we we have been seeing those water quantity problems in some parts of the state, uh, but water quality is one of the main problems here here in the state. So as I said, over irrigation, of course, it causes nutrients to leach from the root zone. Uh, it wastes water and increase energy cost as well, and also decrease recharge to lakes and streams and impact our aquatic ecosystems. But at the same time, under irrigation, so if growers are not applying the right amount of water and cut that water too much, they are going to impact the crop yield as well. So it under irrigation can stress the plant and that it can reduce the crop yields and overall profit in, on, on farm. So both over irrigation and under irrigation has you know, uh, the problem. So irrigation management then uh, becomes very important in, in these parts of the state. So how much water we should apply in order to produce crop that is profitable, but at the same time, help our environment. So that's where my work comes in. So when I came here in 2018, I, I sat down and I, I, you know, made this list and overall it put it in two categories, like what is lacking in terms of research and extension. And these are some of the topics that I am focusing on right now. So there's lack of applied research. That, that doesn't mean that there is no research on irrigation. There has been a lot of research on irrigation, but I would say that's kind of, very old so we need those updates to irrigation for example this is just an example uh, for example crop evapotranspiration numbers they have been you know there have been research in 1970s or 80s uh, but at that time the, the the varieties that we are growing right now were different uh, there are so many changes in management practices that we are seeing now that has been changed so these numbers need maybe revision or update uh, so that's something that i found that we are lacking uh, there are new advanced technologies like precision irrigation, variable rate irrigation management that has been in the market from last 40 years, but there is like very low adoption of it because of lack of resources or, or research on those topics. Uh, and then how uh, crop behaves with different rates of, of, of irrigation. So we have these nitrogen response curves, but at the same time, these nitrogen response would change if you change the water level. So how that nitrogen and irrigation interacts with each other and how it impacts your crop yield, that's something that I thought it's missing in the state. So that's what I'm focusing on. And I'll be talking about these research projects uh, in, the, in the coming slides. And on the other hand, uh, 
as I said, the resources are available. Like in the market, if you go, there are soil moisture sensor technology, just an example. There are like hundreds of companies that are selling soil moisture sensors now. But adoption in our state is not, is not that great because of lack of you know, uh, technical expertise. So who are the first contact with growers? It's either extension educators or uh, the soil water conservation district staff who are not very well equipped with this kind of knowledge, irrigation management and irrigation training. So that's where uh, I am right now focusing on uh, maybe providing this educational opportunity for both uh, government agencies and growers so that they know what's available to them and how they can use it. And just an example, I borrowed this slide from my uh, colleague in Oklahoma State. Uh, this is the USDA 2018 data that shows you percent farms using soil moisture sensors in deciding when to irrigate. Uh, and different states, so you can see uh, Minnesota is 11%. So 11% of our irrigated farms are using soil moisture sensors, which I think is not a very bad number. Uh, based on how much research we are doing in, in irrigation in the state. We are very close to US average, but as compared to other states like Nebraska, California, it's very low. So that's where I'm focusing on to increase that number uh, in, in the future. So what, what is the solution? I think uh, focusing on the solution is, is, is doing the applied research to find out what are the best management practices and then translating or transferring that knowledge uh, through extension to all the researchers or producers and other stakeholders who are working with these producers so that they can make efficient decision. So that's where my, my role comes in. So I am doing uh, some applied research on irrigation and then also doing extension work to, to, to disseminate that knowledge that I'm getting from applied research to our stakeholders. So in this presentation today, I'll be talking about specifically about three research projects that I am focusing on and some extension work uh, that we, we are doing. So the first study, uh, this was started in 2019. I'm calling it as irrigation and nitrogen study, uh, interaction study. So we have two factors, irrigation and nitrogen. And our main goal is to see how they interact with each other and how uh, crop response, uh, crop respond to these various levels of irrigation and nitrogen. So we are having four irrigation treatments, full irrigation 75%, 50% and rain fed irrigation. Uh, from full irrigation, what I mean is that I fill back the soil profile back to field capacity whenever uh, we, we trigger the irrigation and irrigation trigger point is 50% of plant available water. And then I reduce that amount, the 100% amount to 75% for our 75% treatment to 50% for 50% and then no irrigation in rate net plots. Uh, we are doing this in two locations. I'm going back to the locations. Uh, so the map here shows you uh, the, look, the sites where we are doing this study. So Sand Plain Research Farm at Becker and Westport, it's Pope County uh, Research Farm where we are doing this study. And this is the study design at both locations. The areas are different, uh, the plot length and uh, width, but uh, overall the design is same. So the red box is the replication Within each replication, we have uh, irrigation main plot, which is a white box. And then within each irrigation main plot, we have nitrogen subplots. So we are looking at six nitrogen rates, starting from zero pounds of nitrogen to 350 pounds of nitrogen per acre in 70 pounds increment. Uh, so that's our, that's our uh, design at both sites. Uh, total, uh, the combination treatments are 24 treatments and we are replicating four times. Uh, my student, uh, Andre is here, she's working on this project. So I'll not be explaining a lot of things because uh, she might do it in her PhD defense. <laughs> so, uh, but just to give an idea what we are working on, on right now, and Yushin is here and Fabian, uh, they both are co-PIs on this project. So in this one, uh, in this study, uh, as I said, our main goal is to understand how crop respond to uh, different levels of irrigation and nitrogen management. But at the same time, as I said, nitrate leaching is very, very critical component. So we are uh, looking at that as well, that how, what is the best management practice, best combination management practice that yields best results, both in terms of profitability, but at the same time, environmentally. So uh, from this study, uh, we have 96 plots at each location, and we have installed two suction, li suction cup lysimeters in each uh, 
in each plot at both sites. So 192 suction cup lysimeters at each site. Uh, it's, it's a lot. Uh, it's like in this, uh, at Becker, around six acres of area has 192 suction cup lysimeters. So we are getting that uh, water sample every week and analyzing it for uh, nitrate nitrogen to understand that dynamics. Uh, and these all lysimeters at both locations are permanently installed. So we have this research site that we can use for further research or other research projects later on. So without removing those lysimeters, so they are under the till like the twenty inches or two feet or two feet depth. Yes. <laughs> and uh, in this field, uh, we have seventy-two soil moisture monitoring locations at both sites. So we are measuring soil moisture throughout the growing season to understand plant water uptake, so evapotranspiration, uh, how much each treatment, you know, how, how, how they behave differently. And then we are also doing plant sampling uh, three times uh, during the growing season to understand nitrogen uptake uh, by the plant. So some results. Uh, I'll just show you, show you some preliminary results that we found. So at Becker site, and this is an ongoing study, so we don't have a final conclusion. Uh, this year we are conducting it again. Uh, so at Becker site uh, 2020, this is the rainfall data. So in 2020, uh, and I, I just, uh, you know, using that numbers, 11 inches from June 1st to August 15th, that is the most critical or, or sensitive, uh, water sensitive, uh, period for for corn. So I just summed it up. So in 2020, from June 1st to August 15, at Becker we got 11 inches of rain, which is more than enough rain, and that's what we need uh, for 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 crop production. But in 2021, which as you know was very dry year, drought year, we got only three inches. So just for comparison purposes, I put this number in front of you. And same for Westport. In 2020, for this time period, we got four, 14 inches of rain. And in 2021, we got only four inches of rain. So that really changed how we managed irrigation at both sites in these two years. So in 2020, uh, at Becker, we, as the total rainfall throughout the season was 16 inches and we irrigated around seven inches. Uh, and this is the results. This, these are the yield results from both sites. So left graph shows you the Becker, uh, the right graph shows you the Rochelle farm and in each uh, figure, the four lines are four irrigation treatments. Uh, the x-axis is the nitrogen rate. The y-axis is the grain yield. So you can see, you see that nice response curve to nitrogen under all irrigation treatments and even for rain fed in 2020 because it was a really good rainfall year. So we got more than a uh, little bit more than average rainfall in the area. Uh, and the difference between these irrigation treatments is, is not very big. So no significant difference that we see uh, uh, between irrigation treatments at any level of nitrogen. So that tells us that in years like 2020, when we have enough rainfall, even reducing the irrigation to 50% won't reduce the grain yield that much. There is significant decrease in rain fed, but if you compare the irrigated treatments, there, there wasn't a big difference. The reason behind is, is the rainfall. So we got timely rain. Uh, so our soil moisture, uh, so our crop was never stressed even when we applied 50% water. And same goes for Rochelle Farm. The yield was little low and that's because of the soil and the, the climate at that site. Uh, but overall, we did not see any significant difference in grain yield at any level of nitrogen uh, at Rochelle Farm in 2020 as well. And we only irrigated 3.2 inches of, of uh, through irrigation because we got 18 inches of rain uh, throughout the season. Most of that was concentrated in the uh, critical growth stage period. Totally different results in 2021. So these graphs shows you the same sites, but 2021 grain yield results. And you can see how the, how the yield was so much like significantly different at Becker. And if you see the rain fed plot, we got almost no no yield out of uh, out of uh, the rain fed plots so zero yield and then if you compare the irrigation treatments 50% of course was very low yield then 75% and 100% was the optimum yield that we were expecting in this year the total uh, rainfall was 12 inches so we got some nice rains after august uh, but that was not very critical uh, water period for, for corn. Uh, but as I showed you that at the rainfall graph, we got only three inches in that uh, June and June to mid-August period. So we had to irrigate around 13 inches, uh, seven inches in 2020 and 13 inches in 2021 at Becker. At Rochold, uh, 
if you see we have total rainfall 20 inches which is more than 2020 uh, but in that period we got only four inches so all that rain that those heavy rains were in august late august or early september so the growing season rainfall is above average but that that middle growth stage was was very low so we did not see any significant uh, so it, it is very interesting so in 2020 which was a dry year we did see significant irrigation treatment differences in becker but at roshol farm the difference wasn't that big there was some difference but still the yields were like very close to each other and we are still uh, i'm still looking into it why this is but the rain fell the rain fell yield was really low uh, but not zero. Uh, but if you go to the irrigated treatments, uh, the 100% irrigation, of course, is higher than 75 and 50. But statistically, there wasn't a significant difference between these uh, between these treatments. So as I said, we also looked at nitrate leaching to complete the picture. So what we found, this is just for Becker site uh, that I'm showing you in 2020, which was heavy rainfall year. Uh, our hundred percent irrigation, where we applied, uh, and this is, I think, the West Port site. It's hard to see the title because of the Zoom thing. Uh, I think it, it is West Port site. So yeah, we irrigated hundred percent, only three point two inches, uh, and uh, still we got uh, like very high nitrate leaching as compared to other plots. So I averaged only two hundred ten and two eighty pounds of nitrogen per acre nitrogen plots because those are our optimum nitrogen rates or MRTN. So if you look at those averages, our 100% irrigation has 20 pounds per acre nitrogen loss, whereas our 50% irrigation is six pounds of nitrogen per acre loss. So the, the, these different lines shows you the different uh, nitrogen treatments. So overall, uh, what we see is that in 2020, uh, there wasn't a significant difference in yields uh, between irrigation treatments. So there is a possibility in these areas uh, that we can reduce or we can use those limited levels of irrigation we still need irrigation because the rain fed irrigation is not profitable but if you if we look at uh, the differences in irrigation treatments only maybe we can reduce that irrigation rate from 100 percent to some lower level and still make the same amount uh, of, of uh, grain yield and profits uh, however if the year is like 2021 we we do need irrigation and irrigation how much water we apply did make a big difference. So there was a big difference in grain yield uh, in Becker, uh, but uh, at Westport, we did not see that big of a difference. So depending on what site you are talking about, uh, it, it is basically based on that. And then we also uh, found that higher nitrate leaching uh, is, 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 is there in higher irrigation treatments, mostly in 100% irrigation. And as I said, this is an ongoing project, so uh, you'll see more results and, uh, we will conclude it after that last year. Second project I uh, want to talk about today is the uh, variable rate irrigation or site specific uh, irrigation to enhance water use efficiency and reduce irrigation pollution. How am I time? Good, okay. So this is something that I'm doing with the grower. So variable rate technology is there in the market from very long. So what it does is like, if you have spatial variation in the field, you can apply different amounts of water at different locations based on the variability. So this this uh, this figure here shows exactly what I'm talking about. So if you have this kind of variability in the field, uh, and you have a variable rate irrigation system, which means that uh, the sprinklers on this center pivot system can be uh, managed in a way that you can apply different amounts of water in different zones. Uh, and zones are these like small boxes or transects that you can see on the figure. You can manage that variability. Uh, so putting right amount of water to specific location in the field. So we are doing this study uh, in collaboration with a grower in Belgrade area in Stearns County. And this is his field. Uh, and our main goal is to evaluate the impact of this variable rate irrigation in comparison to uniform rate irrigation. So this is his field, which has around like five types of soils. Uh, and it's like very high elevation difference. So the middle map is, uh, sh is showing you the elevation difference. So what happens if he apply water based on the soil variability? And what happens if he just apply uniformly? So we did EC map this field. I didn't do Josh Stemper, who was in my position earlier. He did the EC mapping and I had that data. So I used the same data. So I didn't have to do that. Uh, so this EC map, uh, based on this EC map, we divided this field in three zones. So three different colors are three zones. 
So this the green color is zone one, which is very low water holding capacity soil uh, and very low EC. And then the middle area is zone two. And then the third area, which is a red zone is zone three, which has very high water holding capacity and mostly the depressional soils where water used to stand. Uh, and then using that VRI software, so he has a valley irrigation system. Uh, and these are the zones that you can see. So I divided this field in six pie-shaped plots and then irrigated these three pies uniformly. So the green color, like no matter how many zones exist in that pie, we just irrigated equally. And then these three pies where you see different colors, these are our variable rate irrigation plots where we apply water based on our zones that we created at the beginning. And then in each of these plots, we, uh, we have so many soil moisture sensors uh, and we use a climate EDR soil moisture sensor and Earth Scout data telemetry unit that gives us data online. So I could monitor that soil moisture throughout the season and make those irrigation decisions. So even the uniform rate irrigation plots need some data, right? To understand when to irrigate and when, how much to irrigate. So for that purposes, we put these soil moisture sensors and based on these sensors, we, we were deciding how much irrigation to put on. And this slide shows you the overall results that we found the first year. So 2021 was the first year, which happened to be very dry year. Even the depressional soils, those red zones where you never irrigate, still needed irrigation. So, so our results uh, shows that uh, there is a little decrease in irrigation and you cannot see that because of, okay. Hmm? Okay, can I minimize it? Mm -hmm. All right, so this table shows you the difference in UR, uniform rate irrigation and variable rate irrigation. So three zones in uniform irrigation, all three got uh, 12 inches of irrigation, whereas in variable rate irrigation, only the first zone got 12 inches, but the other zones were reduced rate. So on average, we put 6.6 .6 inches, but if you look at the yield, the yield is not that, th that different. So 257 and 242, and I consider 242 bushels per acre as a good yield when we put 6.6 .6 inches of water. So the water productivity, which is uh, the third uh, column, irrigation water productivity, you see there is a big difference between URI and VRI. And these uh, very partial economic analysis that I did, so I don't know the water cost. Water is not, water doesn't have any value in Minnesota because you don't pay for water, you pay only for energy price. So I used the US average dollar 16 per acre per inch and try to calculate this net income, which shows that VRI, even in dry year, make almost same profit net income as, uh, as uniform rate irrigation. And think about tw like 20 years, like 2020, when we had enough rain and we might not irrigate zone three at all. So that saved a lot of water and, and, and money. So that was a quick recap of that. Uh, now the third project, uh, which is uh, expanding this irrigation management assistant tool uh, to to the state uh, to, to statewide. So this is uh, this project is funded by LCCMR and Brian Rung from L, uh, from Gems from U of M Gems is the PI on this project. Uh, so irrigation managed a little bit background about this. Uh, so this was originally funded by LCCMR in 2015. Uh, and uh, Respec, a private company, helped to build this uh, online irrigation scheduling tool that uses uh, evapotranspiration based or weather based uh, irrigation uh, scheduling method uh, to give recommendations about irrigation. So initially, this was uh, built for only two instances, which is Benton County Instant and East, East Otter Tail County Instant. So these are the counties that you can see on the screen that were included. Uh, and you can also see on this map, the gray counties. Uh, that's where it is right now, uh, starting from 2015, uh, available to growers. Uh, the crops that are included is corn, soybean, alfalfa, potatoes, and edible beans. And uh, since 2015, there are 6,500 uh, 6, acres per year uh, that are being used, uh, that are being, uh, the growers are using this tool to irrigate these many acres. And it is basically a smart checkbook method. If you know about checkbook method, uh, it is checkbook method, but online version of it. So it is really easy to manage multiple fields. Uh, at the same time. So we got this grant last year where we uh, are going to expand this tool uh, to state level 
Uh, and in 2022, this year, we made some updates to the tool and the additional counties for this year only, including these, these highlighted counties, will be Stearns, Pope, Dakota, and Sherburn County, where this tool will be available. And first year, like this year, will be our testing year. So we will be collaborating with growers who will provide us feedback on the tool. And then we will make those updates uh, for our next years and make it available to all growers by the end of 2023 or in uh, growing season of 2024. The other part of this is, is uh, to update uh, the rainfall estimations using some uh, weather data that is that has more, more spatial resolution. So right now what is doing, we have 12 weather stations, uh, MDA weather stations in the state. So it's using those ET values, reference ET from those 12 weather stations. So if your field is like 20 miles or 30 miles away from the nearest weather station, it's still using those numbers, so which is not accurate many times. So we are trying to uh, find solution to that. So maybe uh, using GEMS platform for weather data to have that high spatial resolution of weather to calculate those rainfall and evapotranspiration numbers uh, in the model. Uh, that's one thing that we are trying to do. Then also using some machine learning techniques and irrigation models uh, to come up with uh, some accurate models that we can provide to growers. Uh, and then doing some extension work that the tool is there, we have made all these updates, but how to use it. So we are collaborating with SWCDs uh, who are, you know, work, who are working with these growers on, on all the irrigation work. So uh, training them and training growers how to use this, how to use this tool. And we are right now in process of hiring a PhD student uh, for this project as well. Okay, so this was all about the research, uh, some of the research projects that we are doing. Uh, and uh, last two slides, uh, I focused on uh, extension. So I am an extension specialist. So my main work is to get all this applied research knowledge and then transfer to that growers. So this year uh, in March, last month only, uh, we organized this two-day course that provided intensive training on irrigation practices uh, that can conserve water and limit impact on groundwater. So what I found uh, that we do not have any kind of educational activity in the state that talks just about irrigation. So focusing mainly on irrigation and irrigation systems. Uh, so I uh, co uh, collaborated with Taylor Becker and Annie Nelson, who are our UMN extension educators and worked on this program. And it really, it, it's a, I think it, it's very, I think that it, it, is, it was very successful because we had like full house both days. So it's a two day program. Uh, we limited to 25, 20 seats were reserved for growers and five seats were reserved for uh, SWCD or extension or MDA government agency staff so that they can also build capacity uh, in their, in their uh, institution. Uh, so that was, uh, and then we also worked with MDA uh, so that we can provide some incentive to the grower who attend this. So all the growers who had a Minnesota Agriculture Water Quality Certification, uh, they would get an irrigation endorsement by attending this program so that they can get some cost share money from MDA for implementation of, of irrigation practices. And then we also do uh, every year Sandrain Research Farm uh, field day in August where uh, we showcase what we are doing on the farm uh, to all the growers in the area uh, so that they can come there, come, come to the farm and look at what we are trying to do. And then at the end, I would like to thank all the co-PIs who are uh, collaborating uh, on all these projects, our graduate students who are working really hard to get the data and write papers. <laughs> and then SWAC field crew, Thor is here. Thor, I really want to acknowledge you, you know. Yeah, his team is great. We cannot do anything without field crew. Uh, and then the research farm staff and all the funding agencies. Thank you. I can take any questions. Um, if folks in the room want to ask a question, maybe we can just move up towards the um, camera here, because the mic's not there. You can look here and you'll see. Okay. okay. <laughs> I don't even know which camera is working. This one? Just, the mic is on the Just look into this camera. Yeah. Oh, so, okay. yeah. Maybe folks can hear. <laughs> So um, when you did your economic analysis for variable rate, did you take into account the cost of the variable rate irrigator to install it? Because 
Is no, it? no, we did not. So it's it's just the cost of uh, irrigation. So yes. we will assume that all other costs are uh, constant between uniform and variable rate irrigation in that farm particularly. How how much more does it cost to put in an irrigated a variable rate versus a yeah, so it depends on the size of the system, but in general, for a quarter section, I can say around thirty to forty thousand dollars to retrofit an irrigation system to VRI. 30 to 40, yes, okay. yes, and there are very there are many cost share programs as well that help you, like Equip, and then MDA has, and then the RCPP funding that we got. So you can take an existing irrigation yes. system and retrofit it. Yes, you don't have to start. From this no, way. but if it is really really old system, you might have to start okay. over but yeah so david has his hand up david mm -hmm. um can you ask your question hello Vasu. i enjoyed your seminar um just wondering uh how much revenue might a farmer get in a wetter year like 2020 on the variable rate irrigation like you said if uh they use the 75 or the 50 percent irrigation uh, that's a good question. I, I don't exactly know the number, but as you see that slide, even in 2021, we were like right there, same as uniform rate irrigation. And as I said, we irrigated zone three, which where we, are, where we never irrigate. So if we are talking about year like 2020, I'm assuming that that irrigation, we don't have to irrigate maybe half of the, uh, half of the field, uh, if we are using VRI. So, so there's like, both energy savings and uh, water savings. So I don't know the number exactly. I don't know uh, if that answers. But, but you, you think it would be significant, right? Yes, I, I would think it would be significant, yes. So I think that might be something that would really catch the farmer's attention because drought years are pretty unusual. Yes, yes, I agree. And I presented this at various extension events and people are asking lots of questions about this. So they are, they are uh, interested, I think. All right, um, Fabian has a question. Mm -hmm. um, it was actually the same question, so you already answered. Thank you. Okay. Nice presentation, mm -hmm. Basu. Thanks. Thanks, Fabian. All right. 